Hello, I hope you don't mind if I read off of Zena's laptop. I don't want to print it out, but Bedford Square's network's been down for like two days. So, um, so hi, my name's Leah. Um, I'm a PhD student being supervised by um, Zena Kamash. Um, and my research mostly focuses on engaging multiple publics in developer-funded archaeology. But today I'm going to be talking about engaging multiple publics in archaeological grey literature and publications and the barriers that can exist within, within both of those. So this is just a little slide to introduce myself. Uh, I've basically already done that. Um, so this was me working um, at Oxford Archaeology. So I've worked in the commercial sector, um, so I know kind of what I'm talking about a little bit. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to start with UK planning policy, um, which can be quite boring, but hey-ho. Um, we've had several policies affecting developer-funded archaeology uh, since the 1990s, um, starting with PPG16, um, which was replaced by PPS5 uh, in 2010 under the coalition government. And then in 2012, uh, the MPPF replaced all planning policy statements as a consolidated policy um, which covered all forms of development and it's the policy that we still use today. Uh, so when I'm talking about grey literature, I'm obviously not going to be referring to this grey literature. <laughs> uh, feel free to laugh or don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, grey literature. So PPS, um, uh, PPG16 uh, stated that preservation by record was the agreed alternative uh, whereby the archaeological remains were not deemed justified of preservation in situ and the excavation and recording take place ahead of development. So commercial archaeology units have been writing desk-based assessments, field evaluations, excavation reports since PPG 16 was established and probably before that even. Um, and they, these are usually client reports, so they're produced by the commercial archaeology unit on behalf of the client um, and they're word processed, unpublished and that they're not assigned ISBN um, numbers or ISN, ISSN numbers. Um, and so therefore referred to as grey literature. Um, of the 80,000 odd reports produced by commercial archaeology units between 1990 and 2010, 97.3% are unpublished, so they're, they're grey literature. Um, this mass of grey literature um, is a consequence of the legislation on the historic environment, um, and it's the minimum standard for fulfilling policy obligations, um, so it's essentially a commercial product. Um, in addition, provisions should be made for the subsequent publication of the results of the excavation, and that's what public policy on the historic environment uh, dictates. So, um, so the MPPF, following in the footsteps of PPG 16, states that upon development of a site, local planning authorities should require developers to record and advance understanding of the significance of any heritage assets to be lost wholly or in part in a manner proportionate to their importance and the impact, and to make this evidence and any archive generated publicly accessible. These records should be then deposited within the relevant historic environment record and any archives with a local museum or public depository. So in September 2005, uh, the wonderful ADS, so, uh, Archaeology, Archaeology Data Service, was established. Um, and it's a grey literature library uh, which contains digital copies of these client reports. Um, it's a large sum of grey literature um, and there's a still a large sum of grey literature yet to be made available online. Um, however, access to grey literature is becoming more widespread with platforms such as the ADS. Um, by 2010, the ADS contained 10,000 reports, and today there's currently over 55,000, so there's a, lot, there's a lot on there. As well as the ADS, um, some of the larger commercial archaeology units, sort of like Cotswold Archaeology, Wessex, OA, many others, have their own grey literature available online via their websites and other catalogues. So, um, publicly accessible. So to sum up, government policy on the historic environment prescribes that these records be made publicly accessible, either via the ADS or otherwise. But what does publicly accessible really mean? Uh, making reports physically accessible online doesn't mean they're actually consumable for multiple publics. So this is a great quote um, from Victoria Donnelly, um, whose PhD research focused on great literature. And she's absolutely right. Um, with such a breadth of knowledge now physically available online, it's worth actually thinking about the nature of these reports and their intended audience. Because they're originally designed as a client report, um, this grey literature needed to fulfil the function of disseminating site findings to an adequate standard, but need not meet the standard of, pub of a, publishable, a publishable piece of academic work. The developer's primary concern is meeting planning conditions, um, and simply the production of the archaeologist's report, not necessarily the content of it. So the content is therefore somewhat less significant than the existence of the report itself in some ways, um, and this can result in a disconnect between purpose and content and therefore influences the structure, style, and the content of the report itself. These reports aren't really written with a wider audience in mind, because um, it wasn't their intention to begin with. But it's not just grey literature we need to consider, it's monographs and other publications too, because they are actually published. 
Um, but again, I find myself often asking who their audience is. Um, the cost of these is also another barrier to consider when thinking about accessibility. So archaeologists have a lot to say about reports and publications too. Um, from the ground up, which was a uh, publication of archaeological reports or the PUN survey, surveyed the UK archaeological community to assess issues found within archaeology reports and publications. The survey did not target laymen and instead focused on reaching researchers, field workers and those who have actively contributed to field work publications. But it did ask, are field work publications an appropriate means to disseminate information to the public? And only 22% felt that they actually are. The remainder felt that field work publications are too technical, too difficult to obtain and too costly for laymen and suggested that more appropriate mediums were outreach events targeted towards the wider public. So open days, museum exhibitions, popular audience publications, television, radio programmes, etc. But research into visitor experience in museums has sometimes suggested that people actually learn very little from exhibitions. So who's to say what medium is best for the public to interpret archaeology? And perhaps grey literature is a somewhat <coughs> unrecognised but valuable avenue. Um, in addition, outreach events are not always available and usually take place on high profile archaeology sites, not low profile local development led excavations. So what is available to the local public is the final grey literature report, which is not suitable for laymen. <laughs> so what is suitable? Um, with no outreach for low profile developer funded sites and no suitable final report, the public are left behind the building sites red tape in every sense of the meaning. So the PAN survey also found there was widespread dissatisfaction among archaeologists with reports and publications, so it's not just the public. And the electronic revolution also requires us to recognise that publication and dissemination are no longer necessarily the same thing. Um, so basically, these reports and publications are unsatisfactory to all. So this survey was actually 20 years old, um, and so it's difficult to know what the archaeology community would have to say about reports today, <coughs> given that the ADS exists and other platforms. Whether an academic or practical archaeologist, our area of knowledge is usually limited to, to a specific area. We are all laymen in some respects. It's no surprise that there has been widespread dis dissatisfaction with grey literature reports, which usually expects a great deal of knowledge from the reader. So if the archaeological archaeological community were or are mostly dissatisfied with these reports, and they are not designed to be consumed for a wider audience, then we must ask what can be done to really fix this issue. Um, especially as for many development-led excavations, multiple publics only have the reports to look to for information about their local historical landscape. So to investigate this a little further, I conducted focus groups with the public and archaeologists to explore the barriers that exist within these reports and publications. And my aim is to find out if there are improvements that can be made to these reports to make them useful to a wider audience whilst acknowledging the funding and time constraints on commercial archaeology units. So these are the questions I wanted to think about. So mostly it's about enjoyability of the reports. Um, can the presentation be improved? Are there other mediums that are more suitable? Um, and do they actually know how to access them in the first place? So, um, so this study, this is going to be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of my research so far because it's not actually finished. Um, um, so I've conducted a total of 10 focus groups with 38 participants overall, um, and I'm still currently conducting focus groups. Um, of these, um, 10 participants are aged over the age of 50, and the rest fall within the 20 to 30 age range. Um, of these, uh, seven were actually archaeologists, four were volunteers um, in archaeological groups, um, and the rest are members of the public. So to give you an idea of how the focus groups actually worked, each group was provided with questions, along with samples of grey literature reports, published monographs, and archaeological comic strips. So this is one from uh, uh, John's comics on the screen, as you can see, um, ahead of time so that they could familiarise themselves with the material and highlight words and phrases that they didn't understand. I wanted to also assess if being local to a site affected their actual enjoyment of the report. So I selectively chose reports that were local to some participants. Um, so, one of the big first questions I wanted to, uh, wanted to answer was, do people know where to actually find these reports and publications in the first place? Of the five people who did know how to access them, <laughs> which is not very many, um, three were actually archaeologists already, and two were the volunteers in archaeological groups. Um, so this was the same result for both grey literature and the um, reports and, and the monographs. Um, so if people don't know how to access or these reports or even know they exist, um, are they really publicly accessible? <laughs> um, even some of the archaeologists didn't actually know about the ADS, which is quite surprising. Um, so thinking about target audience, um, so target audience for the grey literature report. So the majority of participants felt that these were the target audiences. 
Um, these are listed in sort of descending order um, of the most popular answers. So um, for uh, grey literature, people, the majority of people thought it was intended for archaeologists, the client, academics, experts, and then their suggestion of local people was, was kind of a secondary target audience. Uh, they didn't actually feel it was intended for a local audience, but that a local audience might actually gain something from it. And then for publications, it was archaeologists, academics, students, and then somewhat the general public, but again, it was similar to the local people aspect. So, um, so yeah, so this is a good quote from one of the archaeologists uh, that took part in the focus groups, and I'm sure it's true. These things are written, but how many people actually read it? I mean, I can understand that, you know, some monographs and reports do sit untouched for quite a while. So then I want to find out, are they enjoyable to read? Uh, so this pie chart shows how many of the participants actually enjoyed reading the grey literature, um, and the majority did. I was quite surprised. <laughs> Um, but this actually came down to, when we looked at the actual reasons as to why they enjoyed it, was the fact that it was local. Um, it seemed to really relate to, the, to this aspect of locality. Um, and these were some of the comments about um, the local archaeology and the personal connections to local sites. And that top quote is actually from an archaeologist who said, I can't imagine any member of the public reading this for fun. Uh, and looking at publications, um, this pie chart shows how enjoyable they found those. Um, less enjoyable overall, but again, um, if we look at the comments again, these are just a select few. <laughs> um, this was, <laughs> yeah, I'd pay not to read it. Um, this was connected to locality again. Um, without that element, people kind of lost interest in the report. Um, it was also very dependent on the presentation, the length, the language, which I will get to in a minute. So yeah, presentation. So for grey literature and publications, people felt there was room for improvement. Um, for grey literature, uh, there were a lot of comments on the lack of pictures. Uh, one participant said they thought archaeology was a very visual thing, uh, but this wasn't actually demonstrated in the reports, which confused them. Um, and the lack of colour and, yeah, and pictures was a big factor. Grey literature is quite grey. <laughs> who, would, who would have known? Um, and that publications, um, on the flip side, despite the publications actually having more pictures and more sort of visually stimulating elements, participants didn't actually like the style. Uh, columns were disliked by many, and they felt that the style of writing could be improved. So they preferred like an across-the-page uh, format rather than, than a columnized format, as they thought that was more accessible. Um, so basically, both grey literature and publications were lacking in presentation. Are these reports too technical? In short, yes. <laughs> um, people did find that the language phrasing in both grey literature reports and publications were too technical. Uh, common suggestions made by participants for both reports and publications was that a glossary of terms would be hugely beneficial. Um, this was certainly the case of publications. The language was a huge barrier for people uh, to the point where a lot of participants actually said they just gave up. <laughs> um, uh, but for many, it didn't seem to be a case of dumbing it down. It was simply just a desire for clarity and explanation, which I think we probably could all benefit from. Um, so other mediums, uh, the comic strips were very interesting, actually. Um, participants really felt that this would be a good way to engage with younger and older audiences. Um, the archaeologists obviously felt that this wouldn't be enough for other archaeologists, and I'm not suggesting that it is, um, but I think it certainly demonstrates there is a real desire to actually see archaeology, um, and that's something that the public aren't really getting from grey literature reports and publications. Um, the technical language is clearly too much of a barrier to continue reading it in the first place. Um, one of the other interesting things that um, was that the idea that archaeology and storytelling uh, crept up quite a lot in the focus groups too, um, and that the reports and publications were lacking a story. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack in that alone, uh, which I probably don't have time for. <laughs> um, but I like that one participant picked up on being able to release something like a visual comic um, at regular intervals, intervals to create a narrative for local people, regardless of whether there's a traditional story on site or not. So uh, coming to the end now, so themes and patterns. So looking at some of the key things that came out of these focus groups um, so far is that there is a real lack of awareness um, of this literature as a whole, uh, which is a shame because participants did really enjoy reading them um, in spite of the barriers that they were actually presented with. Um, so local archaeology seems to be a key factor in enjoyability. Um, so if there was a source of site information available to local people that wasn't too technical and local people were made aware of it, it would be pretty popular, I think. Um, making it a bit more like visually stimulating, I mean, grey is very boring. Um, we take hundreds of site photos um, and I don't really ever know where they go. Um, 
Uh, and not just photos, uh, blocks and blocks of text isn't appealing to the majority of participants. Um, simple across the page text is, is far less intimidating. But this isn't about dumbing it down. Participants commented that a glossary of terms would be a great addition. Even the archaeologists didn't understand some terms because there's no sort of standardised model with these things. Um, and again, I think it comes down to target audience. Um, we are told to put this information into the world, but are we really thinking about where it's going and who it's reaching? Um, additionally, one of the other things that came out of these focus groups was that participants had a greater appreciation for the actual archaeological process um, after reading these reports. Uh, part of that was that they weren't really aware of how much is involved, um, especially within the developer-funded process. Um, so, and it's very different from their experiences of watching things like Time Team. So moving forward, <laughs> I actually stole this from Twitter, um, but uh, I think it gets the message across quite well. Um, at the moment, I don't have an answer to how we can change all of this for the good of everyone. Um, I don't think there is one answer, but I do think that simple modifications to reports and publications isn't really a huge stretch. Um, I also think that why can't we have two reports or two publications, but one with the barriers removed um, and that is public facing and takes the stuff local people want out of the dry client reports and puts it into a document that can be accessible. Um, this would obviously require a lot of training and time, but we're all talking about making archaeology more accessible. So maybe this would be a good place to start. Um, and I'm far from the end of my research. So if anybody has any suggestions as to how you know, I can improve or if there's anything else I can add to the focus groups, um, please do let me know while I've still got time. So yeah, thank you very much.